In this video, we're going to talk about comparing two quantitative variables. In an earlier video, we talked a little bit about comparing two categorical variables in contingency tables. It's a little bit different with quantitative variables. So often we're particularly interested in learning about the relationships between variables. It might not be enough to do what's called the univariate analysis, looking at one variable. Sometimes we want to look at two to do a bivariate analysis. So let's think about some examples. Do grades decrease with lack of sleep? Do students learn better with more uses of technology? Is there really more fat in a hamburger than there used to be? Okay, so there's lots of questions we might ask that require us to gather two pieces of information and compare them. So to start exploring, we're going to make a picture of our data. So before beginning, we must make sure that we're gathering two pieces of data from each subject in order to make a meaningful comparison. So that means I'm not gathering, um, you know, a set of information from one group, maybe about their test grades, and then taking a different group and gathering information about how much they sleep and trying to make a comparison there. I need to pair my information by subject. I will ask every one of my subjects two questions. I'm going to ask them about sleep and I'm going to ask them about test grades. So we need to make sure that we are pairing by subject. So in this case down here, um, we're looking at the fat and sodium contents of several brands of burgers at like fast food restaurants. Okay, so when I look at that, I, I'm hoping that this isn't like the fat content of hamburgers from, I don't know, six or seven different restaurants, and then this is the sodium content at seven different restaurants, right? I want to make sure that these are paired by restaurant. So maybe this is like Burger King, uh, McDonald's, I don't know, does Arby's have hamburgers? I don't know. Okay, but you get my, get my point here. Okay, so these need to be paired data want two pieces of information from one experimental unit from one subject. So how do we look at this data now that we know that it's definitely paired we're going to create what's called a scatter plot which creates a point on a graph that represents each point represents one of our subjects or experimental units. So let's do a quick scatter plot right now. So one axis is going to be, our x-axis is going to be what we call our explanatory variable. And our y-axis will be our response variable. Okay, so depending on the question that you're asking, are you conducting an experiment where you're changing this explanatory variable to see how the, re the response variable changes to it, to see how the explanatory variable affects the response variable. That's often the case, but not always the case. Sometimes, as in this one, I'm not so sure that we're going to try to make the argument that the, um, the fat content is explaining the change in sodium content, right? I don't know that one is responding to the other, so sometimes you just make a choice. So we're going to put fat on our x-axis, and we're going to put sodium on our y-axis. And I'm just going to do a really quick um, scatter plot just to show you the idea. Uh, our data starts at 19, so I don't know, I'll set my labeling. I'll go 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45. And it looks like our sodium content goes from 920 to 1500. So I'm going to go, um, oops. 900, 1,000, and I'm kind of making this by hand just to show you the process, but you're going to be using and learn how to use um, Excel to create these for you. Okay, and so now I should be able to look at this point. You've plotted XY coordinates before, so I'm going to plot the point 19, 920, and again, I'm just kind of eyeballing it, 31 to 1,500. 34 to 1310, uh, 35 to 860, whoa, that's way down here, um, 39 to 1180, and 39 to 940, okay, and 43 to 1260. 
So when I look at this scatter plot, I'm going to I'm going to talk about in later slides how we can read our scatter plot to say something about it. What information does our scatter plot give us? Okay, but just remember that each one of these points in this case represents a fast food restaurant. So I think we said like this point is Burger King. Right. And we said that um, this point is McDonald's. Right. And so each of those points represents the fat and the sodium content for a specific experimental unit. So how do we talk about the scatter plot? Scatter plots give us an overall picture of the relationship between two variables. So we want to talk about form, direction, and strength. So form is what is the um, overall shape. It's kind of like shape when we do shape, center, and spread. Form is, is it linear? Is it exponential? Okay, think back to the functions that you've learned in your math classes. There's a, a huge variety of forms that it could take. But in this class, we're specifically concerned about the form being linear. So we'll keep it simple in this class and we'll say the form is either linear or it's not. And then the direction, is it positive? Is your scatter plot increasing from left to right? That would be something like that. Or is it negative? Is it decreasing from left to right? And strength, okay, so how closely are the points clustered? And usually we want to say around a line. Okay, are they tightly clustered to each other? Are they really specifically close to the line that we're using to approximate them? Or are they really, really loose? So let's look at some examples and talk about how we would describe each of these. So let's take a look at example number one. And remember, I want to talk about form direction and strength. And I should have mentioned before that if there are any values that are strange, that we also want to mention those as well. There won't always be. Okay, so when we look at this, this is definitely not linear. Okay, so in this case, we're going to say nonlinear. And from there, we're not really that interested in the direction necessarily, um, but we would say it's fairly strong because in its nonlinear shape, it's pretty clustered around that shape. All right, let's move on to number two. I would say if we were to try to draw a line on here, we'll say it's linear. And the line's going up from left to right, so it's positive. And no, well, it's like a medium strength. This is just a judgment call, but we will later have a measurement of strength to help us. Okay, and let's look at number three. If I draw a line here, it definitely looks linear. My line is going down from left to right, so it's negative. And it's very strong. Those points are very, very clustered along that line. All right, and finally, looking at this last scatter plot, not really seeing a very strong relationship here. Okay, so I'm not so sure that we could say that it's linear um, or what direction it was or, or anything. So we're going to say a very weak relationship. No real pattern is emerging here. So in the last slide, I mentioned that there might be a number that we could use to tell us the strength of the relationship. So that number is called the correlation coefficient. Okay, and correlation is a way to um, numerically measure the strength of a linear only relationship. So correlation coefficients are only used for linear relationships. Okay, so for correlation, the numbers vary from negative 1 to 1. And so if you have um, a, a number 
correlation coefficient whose value is negative 1, you're going to say that is a perfect negative relationship. And if you have one that is 1, that is a perfect positive relationship. And if you're in the middle at 0, that's like no relationship. So you're going to get just scatter everywhere, and there's going to be no set pattern that you're going to see. So what does it mean for it to be a perfect relationship? So for example, if you had a scatter plot that looked like this, every single one of those points falls exactly on the line that you would use to describe them. That is a perfect relationship. All of the points would lie on the explanatory line. And there is a letter that we use for correlation coefficient, as in many things in math, and that letter is lowercase r. So in order to calculate it, let's just go back one more time. The data has to be quantitative. The plot's got to be straight enough. Remember, we're talking about describing linear relationships. You want to take a look at the plot to make sure that the scatter plot is showing a linear relationship. And you want to be really careful about outliers. So there's really no agreement on what makes a really strong relationship, like what's the cutoff where you might say there's a strong relationship, a weak relationship, a moderate relationship, because it all really depends on the context of the question that you're asking. Sometimes you might be surprised by getting any kind of a relationship. So even something that's a lower correlation coefficient value might make you say that um, you have a, a fairly strong relationship. It just depends on your data. So let's just, in context of one another, let's just take some guesses at what we think the correlation coefficients might be for each of these. So you'll see, maybe we'll analyze these a little bit. Um, this is a negative relationship. And because the number is close to negative one, we're looking for um, a tightly clustered group. So a pretty strong relationship, but it's going to be negative. All right, this is another negative relationship, but it's going to be weaker. So the cluster might not be quite as obvious. And this is almost no relationship. And remember, we're talking about linear relationships. And finally, this is a positive relationship, and it's moderately strong. So let's take a look here at, at number one. Look, this doesn't have a linear relationship at all. Okay, so I'm going to say that this one is 0 0.006. Let's look at number two. It's positive and it's moderately strong. So that must be 0.777. Looking at number three, we have one of our negative relationships. And the last two, in fact, probably are negative relationships. But look. This is a very, very strong negative relationship. So we're going to say that that correlation coefficient is probably negative 0.923. And when I look at the, my final one, it's the only one left. It's, I don't know, maybe, I guess I could see that it might have like a little bit of a negative relationship, but really not strong. So we're going to say that correlation coefficient is probably negative 0.487. So just one last note about correlation. Um, just because you find a strong relationship, let's say you're, you found a very strong relationship between two variables, x and y, okay, enough to get a correlation coefficient of, I don't know, 0.95. So you're like, wow, there's a really strong relationship between x and y. I wonder if x is causing y to happen. Not necessarily the case. So just because you find a strong relationship, doesn't mean that X caused Y to happen. Think back to the scientific method section. Causation can only be proved through controlled experiments. So be careful that you do not fall into that trap.